Hello and welcome to Rural Ecologies 2. Wow. Super excited to see everybody. And um, Brenda, if you want to unmute and turn on your camera, um, we'll start by introducing ourselves and the whole program. Welcome to everyone. It's super nice to have you here. And um, we're really, we've been waiting for this for a long time. So we're very excited to get going. My name is Kathy High and um, I'm here with Brenda Miller. Um, we're the co-hosts and we'll be hosting the whole um, event throughout the weekend. I'm getting a little bit of feedback from something. Um, so let me just check this. Okay, sounds better, thanks. So um, Brand and I are both professors in the arts department at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. We also were co-founders of the Sanctuary for Independent Media and um, have different roles here. I am the coordinator for Nature Lab and Branda is the arts and education um, coordinator for the sanctuary. We also were co-programmers for this IEAR Presents series of which Ruderal Ecologies is part of. So with that, I'll pass it off to you, Branda. Excuse me. We will start, hello, with a land acknowledgement. It is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that the Sanctuary for Independent Media and our new Nature Lab Center resides upon the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people who are indigenous peoples of the land of New York. Despite tremendous hardships and being forced from their lands, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present, as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Kathy, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, and thanks for that land acknowledgement. That was great. Um, Root, this Ruderal Ecologies 2 virtual conference builds upon a 2018 Ruderal Ecologies Grounds for Change conference, which brought together leaders in art, science, and environmental justice to explore the history and future of urban environments shaped by stress. Ruderal, from the Latin rudus, meaning rubble, first to plant species that are the first to repopulate disturbed lands, an apt analogy for the state of our post-industrial neighborhoods. It is through this lens that we envision our futures. So Ruderal Ecologies II brings together cutting edge artists, scientists, social science scholars and activists working beyond the barriers of any one discipline. Because this is a virtual conference, it's possible to present thinkers and host audiences from around the world. Reflecting our commitment to curate a feminist framework into this conference, the majority of our speakers are women or gender nonconforming. We have also invited indigenous authors, scientists, artists, and speakers with the intention of embedding a variety of indigenous ways of thinking, storytelling, and expression into conversations about our future. For those of you who are not yet familiar with the Sanctuary for Independent Media, we are a nonprofit community organization based in North Central Troy, New York, at the northern tip of the Hudson River Estuary at the beginning of the Erie Canal. We operate a block wide campus of activities. If we weren't in the midst of a pandemic, we would be sitting in the Sanctuary for Independent Media our headquarters that doubles as a telecommunications facility and performance venue where we host speakers, independent film screenings and live music. It's also the home to two recording studios for our community radio station, WOOC 105.3 FM. We host a volunteer driven nightly news and public affairs show called the Hudson Mohawk Magazine. We also run a variety of youth programs operate College City Growers Gardens, and bring summer activities out into Freedom Square, our outdoor performance venue. Our initiative Nature Lab is hosting this exciting conference this evening. We um, opened Nature Lab earlier this year in an abandoned building transformed into a community science center. 
Nature Lab's Biosafety Level 1 Community Bio Laboratory focuses on issues around urban environmental justice and social justice concerning research into urban air, soils, and water. Upstairs from the laboratory, the People's Health Sanctuary space is being constructed to share health skills, provide basic integrative care, and explore ways to build networks of community health. This Rural Ecologies II conference is a collaboration between our community arts organization, the Sanctuary for Independent Media, Nature Lab, and the IER Presents series from the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. The conference is also supported by the Volmer Fries Lecture Series, which is part from RPI, the New York State Council on the Arts, the New York Humanities SHARP grant with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Federal American Rescue Plan Act. And finally, the National Endowment for the Arts. We are grateful to all of our funders. So without further ado, I would really like to introduce our speaker tonight, who is Dr. Max Liberon. Max Liberon is a leader in both developing and promoting anti-colonial research methods into a wide array of disciplines and spaces. As founder of CLEAR, an interdisciplinary plastic pollution laboratory whose methods foreground humility and good land relations, Liberon has influenced national policy on both plastics and indigenous research, invented technologies and protocols for community monitoring of plastics and led the development of the interdisciplinary field of discard studies. Liberal's book, Pollution is Colonialism, bridges science technology studies, STS, indigenous studies and discard studies while providing a framework for understanding all research methods as practices that align with or against colonialism. Focusing on plastic pollution, the text models and anti-colonial scientific practice associated with Métis, concepts of land, ethics, and relations, and demonstrates that anti-colonial science is not only possible, but it is currently being practiced. One reviewer for the book wrote that the text is, quote, at the leading edge of a significant turn in STS towards thinking with settler colonialism as a structure and terrain that contributes significantly, as well as to thinking about how ethical principles relate to lab science and studies of pollution and shorelines. There are exceedingly few texts of this kind that ask how might we consider relations with land, waters, and science, and still practice good science, unquote. Dr. Liberon is an associate professor in geography and is formerly the associate vice president of indigenous research at Memorial University. Uh, so, after Dr. Liberon gives their presentation, we will have a discussion led by Drs. Abby Kinchi and Guy Schaefer. We welcome you, Dr. Max Liberon, and thank you for being here with us tonight. Everyone, give a big round of applause. Kanchi, Kea, thank you for that introduction. Max Liberon, de Shinakashun, la Gluish du Chien, Nikia Metinishun. Uh, so I'm speaking to you tonight from the capital city of Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, St. John's, and those are the, the homelands of the Bailtuk. And uh, the larger province of Newfoundland and Labrador are the homelands of the Mi'kmaq, the Innu, and the Inuit. So the thing about land acknowledgements uh, is that uh, they are less good now that they're super common, which is not exactly what we expected. Uh, so uh, a few weeks ago, I was putting together uh, a panel for the Society for Social Studies of Science Conference for us, and I put together a land acknowledgement, uh, and I shared it on Twitter. And I used the best practices of doing land acknowledgements, including from like my cousins who live in Toronto, which is uh, who the land acknowledgement was from. And uh, a lot of people liked it and retweeted it and hooray it. Uh, and then a smaller number of people really, really, really fucking hated it. And half of those people were trolls um, of the white supremacist variety, although fascinatingly, some of their trolling was like, what, you think 
white people are going to give back their cottages. And I was like, oh, you understand land back. You're a very enlightened troll. That's, that's good. Uh, and some of it wasn't. But then the other half of the pushback came uh, from indigenous folks and some allies that I actually think are legit allies. And a lot of folks are really tired of land acknowledgement standing in for good land relations. Uh, they're tired of them standing in and pretending to do the work of uh, anti-colonialism uh, and certainly decolonization. And a lot of them were saying like, fuck this, we're not doing them anymore and you shouldn't either. Uh, so the reason I bring this up is because uh, part of my jam is working in really fraught spaces. And so land acknowledgements are now that, so that's great. Uh, but when I talk about fraught terrains, when I talk about tonight and, and what a lot of my work is premised on is, is, is when there's no clear path, when your accountabilities are split and your obligations are split. Um, and so in those sorts of terrains, for me at least, the primary research question is how? How do you maneuver them? It's a methodological question. And I would consider myself primarily a methodologist. Um, and the question of how is both a methods question and an ethics question simultaneously. And I think you can... In, in, to with that from like, oh, well, what the heck do I do about land acknowledgements now? And what I've chosen for this moment, which is this is the first land acknowledgement I've been involved in since that skerfuffle on Twitter, so maybe Twitter was one part of the issue too, is uh, just sort of explain um, that they are not quite so awesome all the time or not ubiquitously or not completely or monolithically. So the premise of my work and this talk and my book, and if you ever have a academic chat with me, is that methodology is uh, a way of being in the world and not just doing in the world. So all methods, all, all doings, uh, whether they're artistic or scientific or cleaning your house or whatever, enact land relations uh, and are part of land relations simultaneously. Uh, they can be colonial land relations, they can be anti-colonial land relations, but method is just another way to say land relations. And that's great, but th the problem becomes, okay, what if those land relations are both colonial and anti-colonial like simultaneously? And so that's sort of where I'm going to land today. Uh, and I, I'm sort of choosing this topic, which is a topic that I'm, uh, I haven't written about uh, explicitly before, although I think it's pretty latent and sometimes not so latent in my work. Uh, and in my book, but I'm talking about this because I think it really fits the topic of rural, 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 anyway, the ecologies that start with R that this symposium is about, uh, ruin-based ecologies, right? Things that happen after purity and grand scales and utopias are like off the table. Uh, and that's really great because we can just start the conversation further along, uh, which is nice. And so the question, methodological question of how becomes how do you work on the ground you stand on with all of the shitty inheritances that ruination uh, and colonialism and all these sorts of things bring. So I'm going to talk through three examples tonight. Uh, the first is environmentalism, the second is care, and the third is life. So like super like topics. And in each case, I'm going to talk about how they're fraught terrains um, and this, this idea of what I call uh, incommensurate goods or um, incompatible ideas of what is good. Uh, and each example, the goods will get more and more fraught and the terrain will get less and less clear for, for navigation uh, and things will get trickier and trickier. And there is no, by the way, resolution at the end of the talk, uh, but there is like a pretty well-defined hot mess um, or described hot mess. So uh, I'll be talking quite a bit um, about uh, the book that I've recently, well, I haven't recently written it. I I've been writing it for over a decade, but uh, that's recently been released to the public. Uh, Pollution is Colonialism. Oops, this way. It's like the weather person. Everything's backwards and also nothing is actually truly there. So I can't, <laughs> I can't check. Uh, so Pollution is Colonialism is with, is with uh, Duke Press. Um, it's a short-ish book, and a lot of the ideas uh, I'll be talking about have, have some seeds in there. And also, if you've started looking at this book at all, you'll know that I'm a really big fan of footnotes uh, and citations in particular being on the page. Um, so you can literally see whose shoulders I stand on and whom, whom I'm launching with uh, and in conversations with. And so I tried to do that for this talk, but it's real hard to get footnotes in Zoom. They're, they're all, you're, the person is always on the bottom because of gravity, so that's fine. Uh, so throughout the talk, there'll be head notes. Uh, and at the end, I'll, I'll provide a bibliography uh, as well in the chat. 
so that's that's what that's all about so let's start with an easy fraught terrain or easy to me because i've already written the book and edited it at least a million times uh, so i'm going to talk about two particular land relations uh, that have different and usually incommensurate ideas of what is good and that's environmentalism and anti-colonialism uh, yeah so uh, this is straight out of the book uh, i talk about colonialism as more than just the intent or identities or heritages or values of settlers and their ancestors uh, instead, colonialism is a way to describe uh, relationships that are characterized by conquest and genocide, which are two of the techniques that grant colonial and settler access to indigenous land for settler and colonial goals. So this is the bumper sticker uh, sort of working, working boundaries uh, of when I say colonialism, what I specifically mean. Now, this isn't a universal definition of colonialism. There's lots of different colonialisms around the world, lots of different land relations, but this one works really well for settler colonialism uh, and the type of colonialism that is in what is lately called North America. Um, yeah, so the focus on land, the, the little orange land there, it's not just uh, dirts and bees and trees. Uh, it also uh, refers to uh, indigenous ideas and concepts and life and knowledge and all this, all our relations. Uh, and so that means the focus on land doesn't always mean, and colonialism doesn't always mean accessing, you know, dirt to make private property for settlement, although it, it does totally mean that too. Uh, it can also mean like using indigenous, um, you know, designs or symbols in art. It can mean access to indigenous land for scientific research or materials for art or something like this. It can mean imagining a clean and healthy and pollution-free future and working towards that by doing beach cleanups on Indigenous land without permission or consent from those Indigenous people. And so when I talk about non-Indigenous goals, desires, and futures, I include ones that are benevolent. Uh, and that's why it's really important to talk about environmentalism. So there are some scholars who talk about what I'm about to talk about very, very well and very, very in depth. Uh, Dina Gillow Whitaker, uh, who's uh, Colville Confederated Tribes, and Kyle White, who's Potawatomi, both talk about at length how environmentalism is not only not the opposite of colonialism, but environmentalism usually doesn't even address colonialism and very often reproduces it. So they talk about how environmental solutions like uh, hydroelectric dams or consumer responsibility or appeals to the commons or composting or whatever, they all assume uh, access to indigenous land and its ability to produce value for settler and colonial futures and the stabilization of those futures, which means environmentalism propagates and maintains the dispossession of indigenous people for the common good of everyone else. Now, this doesn't mean environmentalism is necessarily bad. This is, you know, mostly mainstream environmentalism. But the, the reason I'm bringing this up is not to like poop on environmentalism, but to point out that this is a very clear example of where there are different and incommensurate ideas of what is good. And you can be meeting some goods while also doing colonialism. And a really good text uh, for thinking through this is uh, Tuck and Yang's Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, which for many of us is like a key stone text. Um, and in this, in this work, Tuck and Yang talk about how decolonization in settler occupied territory in, in Canada and the United States means land back. That's the fullest of what it means. Um, so that means environmental things that are not land back are not decolonial. Uh, it means inclusion uh, is not land back, so it's not decolonial. Um, and one of the main uh, arguments that they make is when you start conflating different, different goods, like uh, in, uh, inclusion and anti-racism and taking your shoes off at the front door with, with colonial or yeah, decolonization, then things like making diverse syllabi are so suddenly supposed to be decolonization, but they don't actually change land relations. And because it seems like something's been dealt with, people move on to the next problem, uh, which is the critique that people have about, indigenous people have with land acknowledgements going mainstream as well. So if the goods are conflated, so are the bads and so are the interventions basically. Um, so these are the stakes of articulating different goods. 
right? Especially when they're incommensurate. Uh, they actually are integral to doing the type of changes that I think we generally want to do. So that was example one, environmentalism. Example two, I'm gonna talk about care for a bit and science. So dominant science, uh, which is a flavor of Western science, um, is pretty colonial, sexist, racist, elitist, macho, exclusive, individualist, masterful, extractive. It believes in binaries like male, female, nature, culture, life, death. It believes in objectivities. And a lot of these ideas have become uh, really unexceptional norms through everyday practices. And they just get reproduced kind of easily and effortlessly in dominant science. And I know this because I am a dominant scientist. I'm a scientist in the in the tradition of dominant science, right? So I have a lab coat. It's part of my day job. I have microscopes and scales and pipettes and stuff like that. And so the question for me as a scientist is not how will science care for me, but how do I care for science? Because as a scientist, that's part of my domain. That's part of my obligations. So as a scientist, how do I care for a science that tends to be colonial, sexist, racist, elitist, macho, exclusive, and blah, 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 right? And what's interesting is that even though I studied a lot of science and technology studies, I do not have a good answer for that because uh, I haven't, in that practice, I didn't care for science. I used to exclusively critique it, especially as a graduate student. But when I came here to Newfoundland and Labrador, there was a lot of what's called undone science. So there was a lot of things we didn't know about pollution here because they hadn't been studied um, in a scientific register. And a lot of that was needed, that sort of research needed to do different type of political change. And so I started doing science. Um, and that's a little bit awkward, right? If you're an indigenous person in dominant science that's super colonial, there's like, that's a little awkward. So there are a couple of theories or concepts that have really helped me in this work. Uh, one of them uh, is uh, Charles Hale's concept of compromise. So Charles Hale is a, is a white guy who works with Indigenous folks sometimes. And he talks about how if you are trying to change a system or work within a system that you've already identified as screwed up, um, you are going to reproduce parts of that system while you also change that system. And there's no when we say there's no outside of the system, that's what we mean. Right, and then also in Takin Yang, there's this great part um, on called, it's like three or four lines, and I wish it was a book, um, but it, it, they talk about an ethic of incommensurability, uh, which is an ethic that recognizes differences without conflating them, hence the like not conflating decolonization and like, I don't know, brushing your teeth three times a day, different types of good. Um, but with also without smoothing them over or dichotomizing or abandoning them. Right, keeping them in complex and ongoing relationships as an ethic. And so these two, these two ideas and, and others uh, are really helpful because they are against purity politics, right? They're against the idea of doing action on a clean slate. And one of the issues I often encounter, especially with students that I'm encountering right now in my classes, um, but also popular in some expert discourse around the sort of, around action is this idea that your intentions and your actions can be devoid of compromise or contamination or the man or the system or whatever. But that's terra nullis. That's the colonizer's dream. This idea of, a, of an unblemished, hasn't been touched before playing field. You don't get to choose the ground you stand on. And often it's kind of a crappy. And that is that crappiness is your, the basis of your collaboration with the world, right? You don't get to be outside of land relations. So I keep this in mind when I think about caring for science as a scientist, um, how to care for sexist, colonial, racist, uh, you know, science. And Kim Talbert talks about sort of coming to this realization as, as well in this piece called uh, Standing With and Speaking as Faith, which is a really great piece where she talks about how, again, she comes up through her graduate degree, learning exclusively critique and not really care for her research subject. And she's, uh, even though she learns about it technically in books and in seminar, and she starts her career uh, researching uh, white settler genomicists who are doing this really violent act of equating indigeneity with DNA, <laughs> uh, which is not how most indigenous folks 
or I don't know of any, there's not a single indigenous nation, according to experts on this, like Desi Rodriguez Lone Bear, uh, who used DNA in any way to talk about tribal belonging uh, or citizenship. Uh, it's purely a sort of settler weirdness. Uh, but she says that as she's doing this research, she comes to realize that she's, in her own bad words, a bad feminist because she's not caring for her research subject. Uh, and so she has to figure out how she's going to do research so she can stand with her research subjects. And so what she does is she switches to, to working with and studying indigenous genomicists and what they're up to. Um, and so just like her, I don't care for or stand with the entire spectrum of dominant science because sciences aren't a monolith. There's no purity, not only for activism against systems, but also for those dominant systems. There's no purity for colonial or dominant science projects either. There are many sciences even within Western and dominant science. And someone who's helped me think about this is uh, La Pepperson, or uh, who's also Wayne Yang. And he, he talks about this in terms of a third university. So a decolonizing university as opposed to a decolonial noun university. Uh, he talks about, in, regardless of its colonial structure, right, and its origins, because the university is full of moving parts and machines and techniques and legacies, uh, it's not a monolith. And so its machinery is always available to being subverted to decolonizing purposes, right? And so that means we have a theory of change that has to account for, or we need, yeah, we need a theory of change that accounts for the permeability of the apparatuses of power, right? And the fact that even neo-colonial dominant systems inadvertently support multiple decolonial agendas because they aren't monoliths uh, and giving them that sort of power um, means that your only theory of change would be throwing your soft body against a solid brick wall until you turn into a pulp. And that's a really poor theory of change. So one of the ways I think about caring for science, um, but also the complexities and the fraughtness of caring for science um, is one of the things our lab clear, the, lab, the lab's name is clear. One of the things we do in clear is we, we work on finding anti-colonial methods that basically interrupt this situation. So we don't always do land back. We rarely do land back, but we can certainly stop the entitled, uh, the entitled access to land in different ways, like say only going where we're invited by indigenous folks, for instance. Um, but another thing we do is we, we publish and make very accessible all of our research methodologies um, with the intent that indigenous governments and indigenous uh, communities who don't have a ton of grants and don't have fancy laboratories, although my lab isn't fancy, uh, but it doesn't even have shitty laboratories, um, can also do the type of research that we're doing so that they can com you know, compare it and, and uh, yeah, get the kind of data that, that settler, the settler state might demand of them. And so that in one way is caring for and through science, but at the same time it's reproducing parts of the system we're trying to change, including, um, right, uh, continuing to hold up forms of evidence uh, that the settler state uh, privileges. So, and this is, that's an easy example. I was gonna give harder examples, but this is being recorded and some of them aren't legal. So we're gonna skip that. Uh, or it's in the gray area and I, I wanna keep doing some stuff uh, that, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say about that. So one of the things I think about when you, when I think about caring for dominant science as a scientist, it really helps me understand that care is about entanglements on uneven terrain that reproduce that uneven terrain. And it's not a benevolent good. And that's the full story. And we know that there's, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, there we go. There's readings like, or texts like Murphy's unsettling care that talks about some of the colonial underpinnings of care work, right. And this sort of thing. Um, so there's some folks to think through uh, the issue with. All right, so the last example I'm gonna talk about in terms of maneuvering incommensurate goods um, in therefore fraught terrain is about uh, life, death and disposal. So one of, the, one of the main types of research we do in my lab uh, is we research, uh, uh, Inuit food webs, mostly Inuit food webs, also settler food webs, wild food, human food webs that depend on wild food, although our main, our main work is with Nunat Siavut government. Um, so we'll get animal guts and we'll look in them for plastics um, to sort of see where plastics are in human food webs and wild food webs. 
Uh, so what happens is hunters and fishers, when they hunt and fish, they'll get animals, they'll send us the animal guts, we'll look in them for plastics, which means that by the end of a study, we have a whole lot of animal guts and they can't be eat eaten because at this point they're very, very freezer burnt. There are some animal guts you can eat. Um, and they're also done being scienced. And so university protocol, because they're uh, organic tissues, would normally be that you incinerate them. But we've gotten uh, permission from the biohazardous committee uh, to return them to the land uh, if they're not toxic. So that's what we do. We, we call it gut rematriation. Um, and we base that practice on indigenous protocol because um, both in Métis and in some Inuit uh, protocols, that is what you do with guts and you do them in very similar ways. But when we return the guts to the land, there's there, we have a lot of settler folks and non-Indigenous folks, other non-Indigenous folks in the lab. Um, so, it, so they don't have those traditions, but it's very similar to say composting, which a lot of them will do, or ecological nutrient circulation. We've got a lot of scientists and ecologists in the lab. So it makes sense in those registers. Uh, and so it looks like when we're doing this, that we're all doing the same thing, but I would argue that we're actually doing very different things. So, how different people in the lab are understanding these animal guts, I think are uh, fundamentally different. And uh, I'd like to introduce you to Vanessa Watts and her really awesome piece on indigenous place thought, where she talks about um, how there's a colonial way of understanding the world that removes the how and the why out of the what. So objects get evacuated of their, their hows and whys. Uh, and so what's left are these objects that are ready for uh, human interpretation, inscription, et cetera. Um, and the reason this is important uh, is when even in the most caring and loving uh, descriptions, things like dirt or other parts of the world are acknowledged in what STS would call an actant, right? So something that is enlivened, but not actually alive. And it's no longer an afterthought, like these objects, This, in her case, she's talking about dirt. Um, it's no longer an afterthought. It gets brought into human relations in a very big way, but it's still a human relation, right? So it, questions are about how the dirt affects me or how do I affect the dirt? Um, and that means that the agency of the dirt is limited to sort of a human-centric uh, set of relations. Um, and even if it's a loving relationship uh, or a caring relationship, the, the concept of an actant is still quite reduced. And this type of dirt, she says, is not first woman. So for Vanessa Watts, who's Haudenosaunee uh, and Anishinaabe, uh, and for many other indigenous cosmologies, although I don't think Métis actually, uh, things like dirt and rocks and trees and air and animals uh, are alive. They make decisions, they're making judgments uh, they're passing their judgments on, they're making memories, they're passing those memories on through generations. Um, and that is not what an actant is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something different. So I see this example play out a little bit in the lab. So when, when different lab members are taking animal guts and getting them ready to bring back to the land, at the end of, at the end of their analysis of them, uh, they have to go back in the freezer before we take them out to the land um, because we take them all out in big bunches and you want hundreds of guts frozen when you do that. Otherwise it's really, really smelly. So what they'll do is some, some students will, uh, or lab members will, will carefully put the guts into bags. They'll make sure everything's gathered up, absolutely everything, put it in the bag carefully and then pop them back into the freezer. Other students kind of look like they're doing the same thing, but you can see that they fold up the guts like they're dressing them. They, they move them into the bag. They escort them to the freezer. And these subtle differences uh, sort of indicate the, the lab members that treat them like an actant, something to be respected, um, but something with an essence, but not life. While the second set are treating them like relatives that are alive, even though they're animal guts. Right. And so while in the lab, I can talk about respecting guts and death a lot for people who don't believe that they're alive, I can never bring about those two set those two sets of lab members. Um, and actually, I'd say there's probably more than two sets, but I can never bring those into alignment. And this this doesn't mean and this thing I'm talking about does not mean and cannot mean 
that everyone has to understand rocks and dirt and guts as alive, as things that make decisions uh, or how to be good kin with rocks or any of these sorts of ideas uh, that come out of in various indigenous uh, ontologies and cosmologies. And that is good. Because first of all, not only is it uh, impossible, uh, it's also not good <laughs> to, if you start conflating those things or start trying to, to resolve those things. So there's a few there's a few reasons we don't want indigenous con various indigenous concepts of life or kin or cosmologies to become universal or fully understood by a variety of, of folks. First is because there's no such thing as an indigenous cos concept or indigenous cosmology. Pan-indigenous cosmologies don't exist. Right. So like I said, Métis folks, as far as I know, uh, dirt isn't alive. Although now that I say that, I'm pretty sure we have grandfather rocks, so I might be wrong and I need to check. Um, yep. But still, they're not uh, universal. Right. So there's no such thing as an indigenous cosmology or an indigenous approach to kin or an indigenous approach to life or something like that it doesn't exist. Secondly, there is no method outside of white possession that would ever allow someone who's not indigenous to fully take on indigenous cosmologies and ontologies, right? And going back to our working definition of colonialism, access to indigenous concepts and cosmologies of land to enrich non-indigenous goals, futures, research pursuits, relationships with the world uh, is a form of colonialism. And this gets said a lot. Um, third, uh, there's this really great book by Jennifer Nash called Black Feminism Reimagined. That's all about what happens when uh, your the ideas from the mainstreams or the margins go mainstream. So in her case, she's talking about intersectionality. Um, she says when intersectionality goes mainstream in, in, um, in feminism and women and gender study, what happens is it's there to enrich white feminism. It's like a, it's like a corrective for white feminism to fix some of its tendencies. And because it's, a, uh, it's there as a corrective, it ends up in a permanent service position, right? Secondly, what happens with that is that black feminists are in a constant position to do what she calls um, defensive work. Right, so, so correcting how intersectionality is used or not used properly, or people are like, I have beautiful intersectional jewelry, and they're like, ah, you know, that kind of work, right? Which is exactly the kind of work I did at the start of this talk when I said, okay, let's work on what decolonization is and isn't, which I am having to do in every presentation I give, because currently you can like decolonize your kitchen sink as long as your plumber smudges or something like this, right? And it leaves those colonial land relations intact. Uh, yeah, I highly recommend this book. It is very good. Fourth, the other reason we don't wanna just sort of use indigenous cosmologies uh, uh, is that we know from standpoint theory and regimes of imperceptibility and, and all of these um, ideas from feminist STS that the diversity of ontologies are a good thing. And the problem is when one way becomes dominant or mainstream, because that is always to the exclusion of other things. So those are all the reasons. Yeah, that I don't want everyone in the lab to understand guts as kin or as relatives or as alive. So while there might be overlap in certain areas, like, like it all looks like we're doing the same thing when we're putting guts back into the land, onto the land, uh, there are certain parts of that that are not only not totally understood across all the lab members, but some of them don't ally or align as well. Uh, and they can cause conflict or harm, right? But sometimes they, at the same time, they often do overlap. So this is where standing with gets tricky or even impossible um, because at the same time, you're still called into an ethics of care. And so this is when I really think about, again, Tuck and Yang and their ethic of incommensurability that recognizes what is distinct, what cannot be joined or conflated, and, and they say that this ethic is, is a way that brings these areas into conversation without papering over differences, but also without maintaining false dichotomies. So having the like indigenous, non-indigenous um, as a hard line is also not in our best interests. So this sort of mess of incommensurate goods and not dichotomizing incommensurabilities is, I think, the tricky methodological and ethical question of feminist and anti-colonial sciences, art, research, methodology in general. 
because it nuances what compromise means. It no longer is just the reproduction of the bad when you're trying to do good, but it's also about the reproduction of different and incommensurable goods <laughs> that can do violence through mutually exclusive goodnesses, but also don't all the time. So the question is, how do you work with these in every instance? So that's my current sort of research question, what I'm left with. These are the sorts of questions of where I am right now. Maybe you are also in that kind of space. I think these kinds of questions are quite characteristic of doing change work in dominant spaces, uh, which means, and I think a lot of the people here are interested in that kind of change work. So uh, I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Wow, quite impressive. And also um, really gave me a lot to think about. So I really appreciate that. I'm going to be chewing on this talk for a while. Um, and we have two really wonderful colleagues of mine who are going to help us jumpstart the conversation. Um, two actually quite brilliant colleagues of mine who I would like to introduce now. So let me um, jump to that and bring them both in. Um, the first person is Dr. Abby Kinchy, who is a sociologist whose research and teaching focus on environmental challenges and the relationship between science and democracy. She lives in Troy, New York, where she is a professor in the, of the, in, in the Department of Science and Technology Studies at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Kinchy has written two books that explore how ordinary people use citizen science to examine environmental problems and advocate for solutions. Science by the People, Participation, Power, and the Politics of Environmental Knowledge, co-authored with Aya Kimura, and Seeds, Science, and Struggle, the Global Politics of Transgenic Corps, uh, Crops, sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking back to death, crops. Kinshi also led the Watershed Knowledge Mapping Project, a study of volunteer watershed monitoring projects in Pennsylvania and New York, where concerned citizens aim to use water quality data to protect their streams from the impact of natural gas development. I'd also like to mention that um, Abby has been working with us at Nature Lab on another project called Our Soil, that uses DIY practices and citizen science to look for heavy metals such as lead, arsenic, and copper in our urban soils. So that's been an ongoing project. We really love that one. The other uh, responder discussant person is Guy Schaefer. And Guy is a lecturer, Dr. Guy Schaefer, and, and Guy is a lecturer in the Department of Science and Technology Studies at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute as well. In his teaching, Guy creates space for aspiring STEM professionals to investigate their relationships with the human and more than human world and to imagine approaches to science and engineering that can build more just and sustainable futures. Guy has worked for seven years with BK Rot, a nonprofit compost hauler in Brooklyn, New York, built around the principles of environmental justice and currently serves on their board of directors. He's written about BK Rot and other community post compost projects in his dissertation, which he's currently working into a book manuscript. So thank you both, um, Abby and Guy, for joining us. Um, I will turn it all over to you. And thanks again. Thanks again, Max. Thank you, Kathy, so much. And thanks, Max, for a really amazing talk. That was, that was great. Um, and um, I don't want to take up a lot of time today sharing my own comments, because I think there's, you know, people are here to, to, to listen to what Max has to say. And so I, I guess I wanted to start by just drawing out one of the themes of your talk that I really uh, connected with and wanted to hear more about. And that was when, um, you use the phrase caring for science. And I think there's just so much to talk about there, um, particularly, you know, as someone coming, you know, out of science and technology studies, which as you say, is often about critique of science and then, you know, sort of now becoming part of the um, world of dominant science itself and learning how to, figuring out how to practice that. 
Um, and I think that, I mean, Kathy and I um, <laughs> can talk about this as well from our own experiences working in this new project of Nature Lab at the Sanctuary for Independent Media and trying to create new ways of doing science um, with community. And I, I just really appreciated what you said about um, describing caring for science as doing uh, or using anti-colonial methods that interrupt science's entitled access to land. And um, I wondered if I could just give you some space to expand on that idea a little bit more about how the kind of scientific work that you do is interrupting this entitlement to land that has been so built into dominant scientific practice. That's one of the things that I especially love about your book that I think you could also expand on a little bit more here about how pollution itself is colonialism, right? It relies on this expectation that land will always be there as a sink for, you know, the stuff that we're throwing out. Um, and, um, and I guess extending from that, I'm giving you now too many things to talk about. I wonder if you could share any um, experiences, maybe from the early days of starting up your lab, um, that those of us who are also trying to kind of begin that sort of journey um, coming from STS and from arts and other places to do scientific research um, about the, the land that we live on. What are some of the questions that we might want to be asking ourselves at the outset? Um, and um, uh, particularly if we're, if we're um, really committed to this idea of forming anti-colonial research practices. So, I guess those are a whole bunch of things and you could jump in with whatever you'd like to respond to. Yeah, the shortest version of an answer would be like, oh, thank God I wrote a book about that. So you can just read the book because it's really late here. And I don't think I can, I don't, that's not already still not all in my head. Half of it's fallen out. So feel free to ping me again, uh, Abby, what, for whatever I forget. I'm going to start with the last part, mostly because it's what I remember. Uh, but like, so starting, so starting a lab, uh, there were a, a series of realizations coming out of STS that helped me understand what STS fundamentally did not prepare me for. <laughs> and that is when I came here, I was ready to critique the science on plastic pollution because that was my bag and there wasn't any. And uh, I mean, it was, there, there's a, a number of political reasons for that, but um, I, I had no way of thinking about how having science to critique in the first place is actually an immense privilege uh, and a luxury. And that the problem of undone science is, is not just like this weird inclusion model uh, and not just like a handy justice model. It's like the freaking thing for a lot of places. Um, and, uh, and so I was like, oh, well, okay, I, I guess I'll do science because I also have science training. I actually dropped out of science and went into art, then dropped out of art and went into STS and then dropped out of STS apparently. Well, I'm still kind of there, but now I do science again. Um, and so uh, I was like, well, thank goodness I know feminist STS. So I'm, I guess I just won't do science like that. But then there was zero answer for me for how to do science because all I had was critique. And I was like, okay, so I don't do this and I don't do this and I don't do that and I don't do that and I don't do that. Well, what the fuck do I do, right? And so that's part of why a huge part of our lab is dedicated to all of this documentation to be like, here's how we do it. Here's the do <laughs> like that we tried and it's not perfect and it's not whatever, but like we didn't have a roadmap. So we're just trying to like leaflet the path so that people can pick things up after us and sort of run with it. Um, and as Murphy has reminded me, like documentation is a feminist practice for these exact reasons. So the movements coming behind you don't have to reinvent the wheels you've already tried, right? Um, so um, I realized that uh, I did actually have a set of skills for helping me do science differently. And that was the work I'd done in social movements um, and for, for the way, so, Occupy Wall Street and all these these other sorts of things that are, were always less defined than Occupy Wall Street uh, act up these sorts of things as well, um, and that's and also like how I was brought up and that's that you start with values and everything you do is supposed to be an enactment of that value and what we would call original instructions but other people can just be like <laughs> walk the 
talk or talk the what? No, you know, that expression I'm trying to say that, like, just do what you say you're going to do and do it the whole way. So if you say your number one value is equity, you better not have a whole bunch of white guys saying that, right? You better like everything you do, how you take out the trash, who's taking out the trash, what's in the trash to begin with, how you ordered the stuff that became trash, all of that better be about equity all the way down, turtles all the way down, right? As Thomas King would say. Um, and so it started very simply like, okay, well, how am I gonna, and it started with feminism as opposed to indigenous STS, cause that's what's available to me. So like, okay, how do I not, be macho, which means how, which doesn't mean don't be femi, although that is an alternative, but like, how do I deal with gender well in this? And it's not just the inclusion model. It's like, also like every, every moment. Right. So, you know, so yeah, so that's how we started the lab. <laughs> uh, uh, and the other thing about caring for science, like I love science. It's exciting. I love looking in microscopes. I love building things that plug in and go beep. I, I love doing, well, I don't love doing statistics, but I love the graphs that statistics make. And there's so, you know, and I like figuring something out that you can't do unless you do statistics on it because you just can't see certain things with your eyeballs and stats see very different things. So like you, it's not hard to love that. Um, and I don't think we should feel guilty about it. And so in science spaces, we were like, oh yeah, I love it. I love it. But in STS, they're like, you love that, that asshole, that abusive boyfriend. You're like, well, <laughs> not all men, not all science. Like, what do I say to that? Like, um, yeah. So I don't think it's a coincidence that I've come back to science as a principal investigator, as a professor, because then I have more capacity to actually care for science and do science differently than I would have as a graduate student or a student or, or a technician or something like this. Does that get at what you're, does that start to get at things, Abby? Yeah, it really did. It was great. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Guy now, and then I think I'll come back and have another question. Yeah, great. Thanks, Abby. And thanks so much, Max. This was amazing. And I've been like so happy to get an excuse to just like immerse myself in like every podcast you've recorded in the last year over the last week or so. Um, and one of the things has just been like so um exciting to me as a former scientist who is traumatized by the experience is the idea that science could be done differently and and you know kind of as, as Abby was getting at and this like you know the, I also highlighted this care for science question um, and I actually kind of want to come at the same thing but from the perspective of young scientists and engineers I mean my my students is kind of who I'm putting into this equation but you know whoever you want to imagine um, you know I've got all these students who um, you know, they have these like, they have these values, these feminist, anti-colonial, anti-racist, all of these like great values that they really want to enact in the world. Um, but then they're going to like go into labs and, and engineering firms and be asked to like build bombs and whatever. They're going to be asked to basically just reproduce colonialism. And um, there's something like so exciting to me about this, the promise you offer that science could be different. Um, you know, this, um, and the, this promise, and I, I like the way you said it, and you had said this in a podcast also, so I, I was picking up on it, this, um, this idea that there's no monolithic science. Um, and so I kind of want to see if, if you have any thoughts just on, you know, for those who don't have like a lab to like, to kind of build out these like, alternative spaces within science. Um, I wanna ask like how else you've seen um, or how else people try, or, or if you have any other strategies for like changing the practices of, of science, um, you know, from the perspective of like a, a young scientist. Yeah, so there's a bunch of things I wanna say and I hope I remember at least 50% of them. Um, so whenever I talk to anyone about change work, uh, I think we always start with two ideas, jurisdiction and scale, or what I call jurisdiction and scale. So the first is that you always have some jurisdiction within your control, even if you're an undergraduate science student, uh, and then also if you're like president of the world. Right? They're very different jurisdictions, but you always have a jurisdiction, your own household, your own room, your own assignments, your own hands your own right you have some jurisdiction even if it's limited and i think one of the problems especially well lots of people fall into is this idea of scale having to always be big but this is why i talk about scale a lot in the book as the relationships that matter so like uh the one of the examples in the book is like okay everyone's got gravity 
And that's a relationship that really, and a scale that really matters to an elephant, but to a virus, gravity doesn't really matter. I mean, it's still there, but it doesn't really matter. And so, so within your jurisdiction, what are the relations that matter and, and how can you intervene into those relations? So uh, there's one student in my lab who's, um, uh, uh, I don't know what kind of student he is. He's somewhere between an advanced undergraduate and a, and a graduate student. He might be an intern or co-op student, which is why I don't know. But anyway, he's, he's working with all these other scientists uh, on these fish papers and they keep calling fish biomass. And he just goes up behind them and edits them all and turns all that biomass back into fish. That's all, that's, that's his main contributions to the editing process is just to call the fish fish. And when they put, you know, you know, there's a rotifer and they'll, and it, they're, they're dignified, you know, with, throughout the paper, they're like rotifer or R, and then they just talk about R's for the rest of the paper, rotifer, our type of plankton. And he just goes back and it'd be like, actually their name is rotifer. And he'll just, so just these little, cause he's in charge of editing and making sure all the scientific names are right and making sure all the periods are there. And so he, and it, and it doesn't look wrong. It's just expanding and clarifying, right? But that he's like, fish are fucking people. Like fish are people, fish are people too. And so he'll put the fish back in instead of calling them biomass, calling them whatever, calling them R, calling, right? And that's jurisdiction and that's a relationship that matters. And that's what he does um, because that's that's kind of the, the one of the greatest scales in his jurisdiction. So so I feel like there's always these, these things um, yeah, uh, they don't have to change the world or change the system. They just have to impact the relationships that matter um, and, and meet your obligations within the jurisdiction that you have because we, we're all in different places in the, in the system, right? That was a really beautiful answer. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll hand it back to Abby. Um, thanks. Um, I wanted to um, comment on your citational practices, um, which you introduced at the beginning of your talk, but I think that maybe people who haven't read your book yet might, or haven't you know, read some of the other writings that you've done might not be familiar with. And so I wanted to give you a little chance to talk uh, about some of those choices that you've made and why they're so important. Um, I know that I really loved all of your footnotes in the book and, you know, I, I probably spent more time absorbing your footnotes than, than reading the, the main body of the text sometimes because there's just so much, um, uh, not only information and explanation, but also expressions of um, love and frustration and like connections with people in your footnotes as well. And then related to that, I just wanted to share that I learned a lot from things that you've written about um, author order and, and sort of thinking about collaboration, um, which is another way of you know, naming the people who have contributed to a project. Um, so those things have been really important to me and I, I bet they would be important to other people here if they heard a little bit more about them. So maybe you could share just a little bit about that, about, about that work you've been doing. I mean, citational politics are a huge, huge area, and there's lots of people doing lots of work in it. Um, core to that, and I'm going to try to answer this a long time so we don't have to deal with Jess's question in the chat, which is a super hard question. Jess always asks hard questions. Um, so one of the one of the issues with dominant science is that it um, erases other forms of knowledge or makes it subservient or makes it a resource for Western science, and this is super common and actually uh colonialism depends on being able to suck up local knowledge digest it rob it and then use it against local people right in various ways and so um being really attentive to um attribution and especially attribution to knowledge from places like twitter where there's a lot of indigenous people doing public intellectualism um saying thank you to all the sorts of people who are doing all of this work of like just, I mean, how many people, like, so Tuck and Yang sometimes talk about like, oh, we had to write decolonization is not a metaphor because we were getting super annoyed, right? They had better things to do. Patricia Nash had better things to do than to talk about the defense of, you know, intersectionality, but they put all this work into it as a, just, you know, to put the signpost there so they could just, you know, and like, thank you for doing that labor, which totally sucked. And I know you had better things to do. And so that takes a special sort of thank you and a special sort of citation. 
Um, and uh, there's this concept in Michif uh, called peotuk, which is erroneously often trans translated into English as be careful, as in like something's dangerous, be careful, that's sharp, be careful. But the the more, um, the way it's been explained to me in Michif and Cree is that it, it actually means something more like, when you walk, you put down medicine, you're also walking in other people's medicine, like these fraught terrains, there's no terra nullis, there's like medicine all over the freaking place. So be careful how you walk because you're leaving it for other people and be careful what's in front of you because they're, you know, and so that's what care looks like. This sort of all of these, all of this walking piled up on top of each other. Um, and so that's how I try and do my citational practices, um, right? Just leaving it lots all over the place for people coming behind me and acknowledging that, you know, you know, um, there's people who came before me and there's shoulders I stand on. And so as a methodologist, I try and make that work super explicit as opposed to sticking in the bibliography or something. I try and get it to rise up on the page and interrupt my conversation to make it not sound like I'm just monologuing cleanly, <laughs> but the, you know, yeah. So that's a, that's a little bit of it. And I was talking to Kathy earlier um, people are like, oh my gosh, how do you get your ideas for the footnote? I'm like, Karl Marx, a white guy, this is an indigenous methodology. Like Karl Marx has the best footnotes in like Capital. They're half the page and all his jokes are in the footnotes, right? And even though people don't always recognize his jokes because they're super dry and, and geeky. Um, so yeah, I was just, I was just like, well, I'm going to do like Karl Marx did. I love that. Thank you so much. Um... I think I was going to ask another question, maybe about plastics. Can we bring plastics yes. into the discussion today? Yes, I was going to bring plastics in. I was going to do it by way of purity politics. So, um, you know, your work is so focused on plastics. And I, um, I want to, um, you, you mentioned in the talk, or you, you were really pushing back on this idea of purity politics in your talk. And I, I really love that kind of um, that reframing. And that's one of the things that's so exciting to me about the framework of rural ecology, the idea that we're not inhabiting a world where purity is even possible or desirable or, or, or you know, it's not on the table. Um, and also in the spirit of pushing back on purity politics, uh, I really didn't plan this question out very well in advance, so it's just not going to flow well. So sorry. Um, but uh, I mean, basically, I want to ask um, how how has, um, you know, how is the approach of, of Clear Lab, how is this kind of, um, you know, anti-colonial, uh, anti-purity politics approach to plastics that sort of recognizes, um, you know, the way that plastics are always already in everything and there is very little control on the part of the average consumer over plastics. How has that shaped your, or how can that reshape our, the people just in this in this room, um, our relationships with plastics as consumers, as activists, as citizens, as artists, as, as whatever. Mm, the same way as climate change. <laughs> okay, I'll just Would do be that. The world's shortest version. Um, so plastics and climate change have something in common and that's petrochemical. Uh, both the extraction, the, the companies that extract oil and produce crude oil, are the same companies that the primary companies that that create the feedstock for plastics, and it's just secondary produced secondary manufacturers who take that and turn them into plastics. So they're the same places, the same lobbies, the same laws. If you end subsidies to oil, you also end subsidies to plastic. Uh, and increasingly with renewable energy coming, uh, becoming more important and more central, the oil and gas industry is turning to plastics as the thing that will make up that market deficit for them. So it is actually in many ways the same problem. Also like climate change, it's a global problem with massively different local manifestations. Um, also like climate change, it's really hard to deal with the global scale. And you could argue that you cannot argue with a global scale. And so again, there's a jurisdictional issue about, okay, what are the relationships that matter? Um, are they political? Are they, you know, business? Are they, you know, financial? Or, you know, and, and how do we put pressure on, on those relationships that matter? Uh, so the good news is you can use the climate change playbook, um, which is pretty well developed at this point. Does that answer your question? Yes, I think so. Okay. It was barely a question, so it's great. <laughs> There is one thing I want to say about purity politics, just to sort of bring back the, the concept of the talk about incommensurate goods. 
And that's that like, even though, yes, we have problems with purity politics, the problem with ubiquity of plastics is that plastics is a primary component of all dust. So, you know, when you see like dust in a sunbeam, some amount of that is plastic. And that means when we're working in the lab, this plastic dust is landing on our samples and we have to do a bunch of essentially purity methodologies to distinguish the plastics that came out of the original pure sample of pollution and the ones that came out of just the equipment and the out of our hair and off of our clothes and off of our lab coats, which are all dyed bright pink. So we can pick those out and that, you know, all that, you know, and so it was this awkward moment for me when I realized that without a purity methodology or method in the lab to distinguish between our original sample, which is a purity politic and the contamination of extra plastics, none of our, our results would be valid. And so we had to figure out a, like a period, period, a purity method. And uh, we've written a paper about this um, that's coming out in an edited volume <laughs> whose title I totally forget, uh, but I'll tweet about it once I remember it. Fragilities and care and repair, I think are part of the title and subtitle. Um, but we wrote, we wrote about this in a, in a, in a, in a paper about the awkwardness of being against purity politics and having to enact a purity methodology methods, um, to, to make sure our science could do the justice work. So this is, this is one of the, the incommensurate goods, uh, yeah, that I was talking about. Great. Thank you so much. Um, should we move on to uh, audience questions at this point? Great. Sure. Great. Yeah, I can. Max and and Guy and Abby, this has been a really wonderful conversation. So thank you all for those great questions. And um, Max, I, we have to acknowledge from our end, you know, a lot of your thoughts and and writings and um, words about you know what how to start this lab and how to how to work with people in a lab have been really effective for us. So thank you for all of those contributions. We Hope to visit your lab someday. Um, so we have a couple of questions coming in, one of which I know um, Max wants to dodge, but I think we're gonna get to it. So yeah, I'll no, start, with the start with the one. It. You wanna start with that one? Yeah, we should start with um, that. Okay, so this is from, and I don't know if I'm gonna pronounce her name right or their name right, uh, Jess Kolop Enuk. And the question is not so simple question, although nice to see you, Max smiley face, um, why STS, why feminism, and why not critical indigenous studies? So actually, uh, I've been staring at that question for a while and I think I got it together a little bit. And that is, um, so like I said, in response to Abby's initial question, actually STS and feminist STS is actually not great <laughs> for preparing me for what I'm trying to do. It has all the critique, but not the signpost. And also, as you know, uh, it doesn't deal very well with indigenous anything very well. Um, but it's the ground I stand on. It's what I, it's what I learned. Uh, it's what I, it, it, it was what I was taught in school. I don't think I ever, I don't think I was ever in a program with indigenous studies ever. I've never been at a university that had an indigenous studies program period. And I've never had an indigenous teacher and yeah, and, and I also, at the same time, as lots of other white passing indigenous folks do, work very, very hard to stay in the closet about my indigeneity in university settings uh, because passing was safety in a huge freaking way. Um, and so uh, that's why mostly what the ground I stand on in terms of, of citations and academic knowledge is, is STS and feminist STS, because those were my teachers and those were in text and those were my classes. That not only did it not prepare me for doing clear very well, it also didn't prepare me for writing the book very well. And the hugest round of edits were me trying to be accountable to the various critical indigenous studies uh, and what you may or may not call indigenous STS. <laughs> Please don't ask a question about what that is because <laughs> I would just refer them to your work. Um, uh, and so I did a ton of reading in the second edits of the book to try and be accountable to, to some of those ideas, some of which I know from just being alive and having a family, but a lot of which I didn't. And so the next project that I'm working on, the next book is all about critical indigenous studies um, and its interfaces with the work that indigenous scientists are doing that are 
who are not me <laughs> uh, specifically, um, because it is much better equipped for doing some of this stuff. But honest to God, I haven't read enough of it. Um, and there are colonial reasons for that, right? Uh, yeah, I've been to many, many schools and I've taught in many, many schools and 0% of them had indigenous studies. Um, I don't think I read a text by an indigenous person until I was in my PhD and I found that by myself through Google. And that was like native science. And that's not a terribly academic text. It doesn't have any citations. Like it's, you know, like, so, or Robin Wall Kimmer, also no, no citations. That's not, right. It's, it's not, it doesn't stand on any shoulders. So I can't track down um, the relations I need to track down. So anyway, that is, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's where ethics methodology and, and legacy come together and how I've learned and not learned. Um, I'll ask a question and then call on another one in the chat. Thank you so much, Max, uh, for this uh, uh, amazing evening of conversation. And um, bringing it back to where we are uh, at Nature Lab, we are extremely conscious of um, the place-based work we are doing um, and the epic historical ground we are on and the water we are by. And we've worked with youth to research this history um, and the ruderal roots of the land we are on. What has been discarded is a profound legacy here. Uh, it's the confluence of toxic legacy and racist legacy. Um, that, uh, and at a time at the beginning of the industrial revolution, because we're like right at the beginning of the Erie Canal um, and the pollution that, be, that began then um, and has made us a super fun site um, is in convergence with the forced relocation of the indigenous people of our land um, that from colonialism, that racism and pollution went hand in hand, an absence of love, of respect for bodies of color and for the earth as our mother could you speak about this in relationship to discard studies and how critical this is to insert into um, the, the discussion between pollution and racism into environmental discourse today? Uh, there are a few approaches to that. Uh, I'll start with the discard studies uh, question. So discard studies is a field or a subfield or an approach, whatever you want to call it, where power, analysis of power is the way you study discard. And, under, and so you understand discards or it understands discards as the way that power is maintained. So what gets devalued, what gets discarded, what is externalized, what is sacrificed in order to let other things flourish and survive and be easy and just flow. Um, so Murphy's reproductive justice, there's, there's a whole bunch of different, different, different terms and, and, and scholarship that fits in this, but basically all discard is a, is an act of, um, maintaining power by devaluing other things. Uh, and so racism and pollution in are just, are just, are expressions, um, and not just expressions, but, uh, techniques of maintaining power through, through, you know, using a discard sort of lens. Um, yeah, that's, that's mostly what I would say. Uh, I am not an expert on racism and pollution at all. Um, so I could turn you to reading lists and that sort of stuff that I know about, but that's, that's not something I can speak about uh, as an expert. Okay, let's move to a question from Paul. Paul, do you want to ask the question yourself or would you like us to read it? You can, we can unmute you if you'd like. I, I already asked Paul, he, he asked us to read it already. Uh, okay. So. I'm yeah, curious I about the most common ways PPL suffer from colonialism relative to ruderal ecology in ways they are unaware, most particularly settlers and indigenous also. I feel like I should know, but would benefit from an explicit delineation. Uh, I actually have a policy where I don't do damage center narratives around pollution and indigenous people. Uh, this comes actually, I think I have the head note here. 
there we go. Eve Tuck has this great piece called Suspending Damage about how, this is one of the formational pieces of my uh, intellectual trajectory, where she says a model of justice that depends on proving or articulating harm basically essentializes indigenous people, people of color, et cetera, as harmed in order to get justice. And that has real and lasting effects. Uh, the, the essentialization and the constant turning to, to deficit and harm and damage as a way to define us as peoples. Uh, and so instead she, she offers other models of justice that do not depend on proving damage or articulating damage or focusing on damage that are based on our futures and our desires uh, and our worlds and how they hang together. Um, the ways we survive together, our collectivities, there's like a, a huge number of ways to talk about um, pollution uh, that does not rely on damage or deficit. And so, uh, um, I mean, you just have to look at any pipeline or deforestation protest by indigenous people and what they're saying to, to hear about sort of the desires and futures that they're working to enact uh, through those, through that resistance. So that's where I would, that's where I would turn you to. And you can Google that. It will be up in the news. Like there's a news story every 10 minutes. Great. Um, any other questions from Abby or Guy? You've been really generous tonight, uh, Max, and I think we're going to let you off the hook pretty soon because you're going to be asleep. As you minute. said, it's late. Oh, I don't know exactly. if you'll have a choice. And as you said, it's <laughs> late there. Um, okay, Beverly, would you like to ask your question yourself? And this will be the last one. <clears throat> sure. Great. Um, Thank you. Epistemicide is a topic being discussed by one of my indigenous friends. She's a Buddhist spiritual teacher and a social work professor at the University of Washington who focuses on public health. I'm curious how to address this loss of knowledge without stomping on feet. It seems it requires enormous mindfulness um, and it's something that some of us who identify as eco-artists are trying to address. I'm curious um, for strategies other than doing good research, providing space for indigenous voices to be heard and listening well. Thanks. Um, I don't think there's a universal answer to that. I think it's always place-based and it will always be dictated by indigenous folks' knowledge, like the indigenous folks whose knowledge you're thinking about. Um, so uh, where I work and, and live in, in, in Newfoundland and Labrador and especially with Nunat uh folks, there's not a, there's not a, uh, people know their stuff. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's, I can't speak to some of that stuff because it's, it's, it's a very different problem here than it would be anywhere else. Um, so I would just say that's a place-based question that has place-based answers. And that's what I would recommend starting from those places. Um, the one thing I do note is that whenever I see the term indigenous voice, I always know it's an inclusion model and I'm always very hesitant to work within inclusion models. Mm -hmm. um, there's two main problems with inclusion models. They don't always have to work this way, but they tend towards either bringing indigenous people into places that are violent towards them because they're places we've been excluded from. That's why the inclusion is needed, but it's generally not a good time uh, because the terms of what the, the terms of goodness have been set by not us, uh, even if again, they're, they're benevolent and, and you know, all these other things. Uh, and then secondly, um, what's the other problem? Oh, the other problem with inclusion is what I've already talked about, which is that it's often um, seen as an enrichment of dominant spaces, including benevolent and, you know, loving ones. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's very helpful. Good. Um, Max, can you do another or you, you kind of want to cut it here? It's up to you. Uh, you you've got six more minutes of my time, so you should take them. Okay, we've got one question from Anna Shimei. Anna, you want to jump in or you want me to read it? 
Hello. Yes, I can. I can ask really quickly. It's kind of a silly Thank question. You. I apologize. I was actually trying to delete it and send it by accident. But thank you, first of all, so much, Max. That was wonderful. And everyone for these fantastic questions. But I just I guess it's it's probably somewhat unanswerable. But how do you move beyond and outside of an anthropocentric perspective um, as a human? Wait, you don't. <laughs> so you don't, you never move outside of, I mean, this is standpoint theory. You can't take someone else's perspective because that's rude and colonial and invasive and violent and also like impossible. So there's that, there's that part. You can't really put yourself in someone else's shoes. I always find that to be a pretty rude uh, move, but at the same time, there are many ways to learn and do things that don't center the human. Um, and I actually think it's super weird. The more I'm in university, the more I realize that a really dominant Western way of learning is if, if I teach something in the class, the students always paraphrase it back to me with out of their own experience, like something, well, I know that because this happened to me, or I'll be like, oh, so I don't know, here's an example of a wicked problem. Well, here's a wicked problem I know about. And I was like, why do you always bring it back to something you have experienced? That's super limiting. Um, and I always... I always think of, don't you ever just go outside and like watch a squirrel or watch a tree for like a really freaking long time and not relate it back to you because <laughs> it's a squirrel or a tree and that would be weird. Like, do you ever, because you can learn that way. That's a, that's a way of learning. So uh, I would recommend watching something for a really, really long time. Um, and even though you'll be a human the whole time, uh, there is a possibility that you don't always relate it back to yourself and your own needs and your own desires and that sort of stuff, but actually like come to learn what a squirrel gets up to and what a squirrel maybe needs or wants or desires. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I like the way that you corrected and rephrased as uncentering. Um, so yeah, and thank you. I also, I do love observing for a very long time. Um, and think you can learn a lot about yourself too. So I appreciate the talk. Thank you very much. So the funny thing Thank to that response is, and you can learn a lot about yourself too, which which goes back to the thing I was talking about that, that puts yourself back in the middle. It's a super strong tendency. Uh, so just notice every time. Yeah. So how do you communicate, I guess, without the first person at all? I think you always own, you always own your shit. You always own your first person. You always speak in first person, but the, but you yourself doesn't have to dominate the frame of your own understanding of the world. If that makes sense. You it own does. your shit, but you don't got to spray your shit. <laughs> Diction is important. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And, um, Let's close out now because I know Max has been, uh, you know, great about all of this. And we've learned a lot from you, Max. And I thank you for all of your inspirational comments and thoughts. Um, so we are going to just, um, Brandon, do you want to talk about how people can get involved with the sanctuary? And then we will just talk about what's coming tomorrow quickly and say good night. Yes, we invite each of you to get involved. If you have any suggestions, questions of how you can collaborate, ideas that you might like to exchange with us, please reach out. All ideas are welcome. From strategizing fundraising for our Nature Lab program, to engaging in art and science workshops, community science, change work proposals, or even radio production about art and science subjects. So please email us with any information, ideas you might have at info at mediasanctuary.org. To those of you who have donated to this conference, we thank you. Please, all of you, consider becoming a sanctuary sustainer. We'll add that in as well. Great, thank you. So once again, really thanks to Max LeBron, Abby Kinchy, Guy Schaefer, all of the people here. Um, and tomorrow we will be starting at 11 a.m. And those will be for talks with Bettina Stotzer, Anna Shimei, who just asked that last question, and TRA Rebo. Unfortunately, Natasha Myers will not be joining us tomorrow due to an illness. So the group discussion will be moved up a little bit and start at 3 p.m., led by 
Nancy Campbell with LA Irons and Jennifer Whiteman. So with that, we are gonna call it an evening and um, let's just everybody unmute and give a big shout out and applause for Max. Yay! Yay Max. Thank you. Woo! Hi, thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Max. Thank you, Max. It was great. Anything we have to talk about before I go to bed? Just sleep well and thank no, you. Okay. You did a great job. Did a no, really it was job. a great opening.